Hello, you beautiful degenerates, and welcome to Links and Locks, the Action Network's golf betting podcast presented by Bet365. This is our 2024 U.S. Open betting preview. It's the best tournament of the year. It's our national championship. The U.S. Open heads to Pinehurst number two this week, which is one of the main host sites for the U.S. Open, and for good reason. We're expecting it to be an awesome championship, firm and fast conditions. Not going to get a ton of win, but honestly, we might not even need it. There have been some awesome videos of the golf balls being dropped on the green and rolling into who knows where off the greens here at Pinehurst number two. It should be a fantastic tournament and some proper championship golf, unlike what we saw at Valhalla last month. We're excited to get into it, and I'm very excited to be joined by Nick Brettwish, whom you can find on Twitter at Sticks Picks, and also Spencer Aguiar, whom you can find on Twitter slash X at T Off Sports. Gentlemen, we all had Colin Morikawa last week. We all finished one shot short of Scotty Scheffler. Let's get back at Scotty Scheffler and catch an outright on the US Open. For the second time in as many years, we had Wyndham Clark last year. Let's see if we can do it again this year. Before we get into our outrights, we'll talk about the course preview. We'll talk about our best bets right now. And then we'll also go through the rest of our cards, talk about any exotic plays we made, talk about our one and dones. We had some momentum after last week. Nick and I both had Colin Morikawa. And then we'll get into our rapid fire, go down the board and talk about as many golfers as we can without going too long for you in our U.S. Open betting preview. But first, gentlemen, let's get into our best bets. Nick, I'll sling it over to you first. I heard there's a wild hammer kid running around North Carolina. That's right. Uh, we're going back to the DP World Tour. Found an edge over there, potentially. We're going with Richard Manzel, top 40 at 4-1. to one. All right, long shot, top 40 play. Couldn't do it last week because... Top 40 market, not very viable in a 72-man field. But this week, full field, 156 golfers, which means the top 40 market is back. Excited to get into Richard Mansell in a second. Spencer, what is your best bet for the U.S. Open this week? I probably would have recommended Christian Bezadenhout over Adam Hadwin. That was a price that moved before we filmed this show, and it's a very minor difference. And we'll talk about it later of why I still like that bet, but... It's a very close gap that I have between that wager and Minwoo Lee minus 114 over Sepp Straka. Straka has been one of the hot commodities on the PGA Tour recently. This is not necessarily the prototypical answer I'm going to give of where I think the market has overcorrected itself, but I do think there's still value to be found for multiple reasons in this bet. Okay. Sepp Straka, really hot, like you said, but Spencer is not afraid to take him on this week. For my best bet, I'm going to go into a very specific fade. I'm going to go Kurt Kitayama over 72 and a half in the first round. But before we get into Kitayama and Minwoo Lee, Nick, why are we bringing the hammer kit out for Richard Mansell? Top 40 plus 400. Yeah, it took, uh, it took a lot of research. I haven't really watched a ton of this guy's golf, but did watch some videos of his swing. And he has honestly been one of the best drivers of the golf ball on the DP World Tour. He's long. He's accurate. His ball striking in general with the green and regulation and the iron play is fantastic. He's sand safe, I believe, is top five on the DP World Tour. Overall, I think seven of his last nine events, he has been inside the top 25 over there, and we've seen a lot of great talent come from the DP World Tour over to Live and over to the PGA Tour, so he is playing with solid players, which means a lot to me, but I just think the market in general has kind of like forgotten about a lot of the DP World Tour guys, and they don't really know how to handicap them. I'm sure that number probably will move, especially with how much I know my friends have now put on it, so uh, bet responsibly, 101, but... Um, similar to Jordan Smith uh, at the PGA Championship. I, I think it's a really good course fit for a guy that's an excellent ball striker. His putter is dreadful in terms of like actually strokes gain, but he is inside the top 30 on the DP World Tour in three putt avoidance, which I think will be a big one here. And a short game solid. So kind of checks every single box, the slim data that I did have, and then kind of put in the expected data that I like to run with. He, I had this price closer, like plus 350, which is still a very low implied probability of him getting inside the top 40, but 30 points of value in the top 40 market. And just keep riding these DP World Tour guys that I seem to find at these majors in the top 40 market. I'm going to keep going with that. He's also a favorite for whatever this is worth in a round one matchup against Daniel Berger. Let's go. I mean, that's. <laughs> I think Roberto would be favored over Daniel Berger <laughs> right now. Um, but I mean, he's... 
just in general, like I kind of wanted to go over the past two years, his ball striking at the DP World Tour has gotten so much better since he kind of got embarrassed at Brookline. I think it was one really bad round. He shot seven or eight over. Um, so he's got U.S. Open experience, and I think he really took it to heart of like what he needs to get better at, especially when you know a fellow DP World Tour guy like Matt Fitzpatrick wins that one. I think he's pretty close to Alex Fitzpatrick as well over there. So just a guy that's really been working on his game and, and hopefully can make a name for himself pretty soon. First in pod play of the major championship, I'm going with Mansell top forty plus four hundred. <laughs> so go. you could join you could join all my friends that hate me when it when he finishes like forty first. Let's hop in. Um we we got some George Smith money to play with. So uh shout out to him for making Birdie on the last hole to cash our top forty at the PGA championship. Spencer, why are you backing Minwoo Lee against Sepp Straka, who's been on fire lately? Yeah, as I said at the beginning of this show, this is a much different spot this week than the typical overcorrection that we get in a price after a few quality showings. I have been very bullish on Straka for the past two or three months. We've seen him post five top 16 finishes over his last six starts, average 4.52 shots of the field tee to green over that span. I don't necessarily expect any of that to change overnight for a golfer who has been trending inside my data for the past 12 months. I think for me, though, I view this as a situation where the recent form that we're, we're having here is negating a lot, or at least in the price here, is negating a lot of the poor statistical data where my model is projecting him to really struggle potentially at Pinehurst. My math ranked him 89th when combining long iron proximity plus around the green data, 75th for weighted bogey avoidance, 88th for weighted scoring, and 74th for expected strokes gain total at Pinehurst. It does feel like we have a situation where his lack of length, and, and it's going to be very important to find fairways here, and, and I do lean towards accuracy players over the distance golfers. I, I do, at the end of the day, the one who probably wins is the longest and the straightest golfer, but really more of where my answer stemming from here is that we get this overabundance of approach shots from 175 plus yards. I think that could put a lot of stress on his middling long irons. The strength of his game always comes from within 175 yards. And if he starts missing greens in regulation, which everybody's going to miss greens here with the, the green complexes that we have. And now all of a sudden he puts the stress on his 115th place grade for weighted around the green performance. There are real concerns that he misses the weekend. Kind of saw a similar mentality there at the PGA Championship where the course was too long for him. It's the one venue that he hadn't found success at recently. I don't think it hurts this situation that we also get a golfer here in Min Woo Lee that I am very bullish on for this tournament. So, you know, I, I talked about Bezade and Houghton over Hadwin being a, another play that's very close. To me, this is 1A, 1B. You can kind of flip a coin of which route you want to go, but... I find myself or I have found myself in all these spots pretty much all in on the Min Woo Lee takes so well. This is not necessarily fully backing Min Woo Lee as it is fading Sep. It's a combination where I get to still fade Straka and do it with a golfer in Min Woo that I do really like. I think it's an interesting matchup with Min Woo Lee being somebody who has elite length, second on the PGA Tour in ball speed, which means he's third in the world behind... Um, Bryson DeChambeau also, who's not factored in, but also great short game. We saw him pitching in from everywhere at the PGA Championship as well, and the putter can get red hot. He loves his long irons too, so could be a very lucrative matchup, and it'll be a lot of fun to back Min Woo Lee regardless of how he plays. Uh, great character and electric golfer. For my best bet, I've got Kurt Kitayama over 72 and a half. I'm playing this one very light, probably my lightest of any best bet this year at just 0.25 units. Uh, it's less of a fade of Kichiyama as it is backing the golf course. And I wanted to do this in the first round totals market because that's going to be the first chance to back the golf course. And if it's playing really tough that day, it's all going to be baked in for the next couple of days, couple of days and not going to be able to get an edge. So if you get a chance to, I'd like to back the bar. I would like to back the course early on and Kurt Kitayama is coming off of the Memorial tournament. We mentioned only 72 players in the field. He only beat two golfers last week. He shot 76. He shot 80 in the first two rounds. Missed the cut. He had a horrific putting week, horrific approach week. And I'm not necessarily expecting both of those things to happen again. I'm really expecting him to play well on approach. But 
This is a par 70 this week, and there are only two par fives. One of them's over 600 yards. The other one's, I think, 590-ish yards, plus or minus three yards there. It's going to be tough to score. There are no drivable par fours on this golf course. The par threes on the scorecard yardage are all at least 180 yards, all between, I think, 184 and 228 yards. So you're going to have a ton of 175-plus yard shots and in, which just means it's going to be really hard to make birdies. If you don't birdie both the par fives, not a lot of birdies out there. Looking at the total number of birdies in the first round market, haven't seen a number this low, haven't seen numbers this low throughout the market all season long. It's going to be really tough to score because every hole, you're just going to be fighting for par. Kurt Kitayama is not a very good putter. We mentioned the very poor putting form last week. He could be ping-ponging on, on and off the greens with the putter. I wanted to back the course. He's in the afternoon with an 11.52 tee time, so the first round is going to be playing pretty firm. He's never made the cut in the U.S. Open. He's played three times before, missed the cut all three times. I like the golf course to have an edge over Kurt Kitayama. I'm not saying he can't play well this week or get a relatively high finish. I just think over 72.5 at minus 110 is decent value. So I'm going to back the golf course early on against Kitayama as he tries to find his form following a really rough week last week at Jack's place. Mentioned back in the golf course, and we'll get into more detail on the golf course here at Pinehurst number two right now. Spencer, what are you weighing in your model and any general observations on the course this week since we haven't seen it since 2014 when Martin Keimer won here by eight shots? Yeah, so designed by Donald Ross, it's been restored twice over the past 50 years by Robert Trent Jones in 1974. Uh, once again in 2010 by Corin Crenshaw. Much of what we saw from this property in 2014 when it hosted the U.S. Open should still be likely relevant today. Ross is always known for these diabolically unique around the green complexes that can veer away from your standard expectations of what we see on the PGA Tour Weekly. That'll be no different here since you get these turtle shell greens that have the propensity to repel shots entirely off the surface. Sometimes that can be up to 30 yards away from the hole. It can move it into traps and these tight lies that add to the headache of the construction. All of that on its own would be challenging to try and traverse because of the complexity of the track. But then we also get what becomes an excessive number of shots from 175 plus yards that are going to be played into these fiery fast greens that have not received much rain in the area recently. Golfers have talked a lot about how balls aren't holding the surface on their second shot. Players have talked about that they're being forced to putt with three woods, other unique variations from off the surface once they do miss the green. Many of those explanations, and, and I'm very curious to hear what you guys had your takeaway with it, because we don't have a ton of data past the 2014 iteration of this, but many of those explanations pushed me into this direction of where I weighed strokes gained approach a little bit less than usual. My thought process there was that if players are receiving a reduced GIR percentage from long distance, we then get this increase for in the projection for total driving around the green performance. I don't want anyone listening to think that I'm talking about more than just a few percent decrease in that area. Although a lot of what I'm talking about there is going to be the highlighted nature of my build of, I want to see how someone performed when you took combined long iron proximity, add it to around the green data. I want to see how you execute your shots from 175 plus yards versus any of your simplified approach projections elsewhere. I added a little bit of the higher apex players. Like I put apex numbers in my model. There's going to be an ability to hold these greens more likely if you have high ball flight coming into there, if you can kind of just drop them in. Um, but my model essentially delivered a very specific approach outlook that took that exorbitant amount of data from all of those areas, specifically from 175 plus, since I just kept weighing it over and over again and I rolled it into one total, there are going to be some unpredictable runouts with a driver in hand. Anytime you get fast and firm conditions, that's naturally going to move shots into those areas. Here we have sandy areas. We have what they call wire grass. There's gorse bushes. There's a lot of places where you can miss. And Roberto talked about this at the beginning a little bit, or maybe we talked about this off air. I can't remember which one now, but uh, where accuracy is going to matter here. And this is a very standard U.S. Open test to where the most high-end success that you can find will come from the player who is long and straight. 
That's typically who we see win the tournament. But that ability to be a fairway finder and have the ability to either hit your long irons or scramble around the green, some combination of that is what's going to be able to keep you in this contest where you might not be able to compete with Scotty's ball striking by just doing that, but one or two of those factors won't take you completely out of the game here. So we're going to have to have the USGA not lose control of these green complexes. That's what they've been in trouble in the past where the course gets away from them. But I I love carnage and I love us opens and it's an interesting tournament because we talk all the time about like, look last week at the Memorial, you get this fringe, you know, you have about 70 players one way or another, a little bit more than 70 there. And while you had a cut, it's top 50 in ties. Now we get a full size field and yeah, like we drop down to top 60 in ties that are going to be making it. And it might not seem like a lot, but those couple different spots do add up at the end of the day, you're going to have to be a stroke better. So I think this is a fun contest. It's an interesting betting board and it, the betting board is all the discussions, which we'll get to are going to stem with Scotty at the top and maybe not so much why you're going to back him or fade him, but really what that does to the rest of the board. Nick, anything else that stood out to you about Pinehurst that you weighed in your model or just general observations? Yeah. I, I'm honestly pretty on board with Spencer. I think the around the green play is going to be very important. I know some people have mixed takes on that. Three putt avoidance was a big one for me, yes. especially looking at like lightning fast greens. It sounds like these are going to roll at a 13 minimum, which is, putting in your driveway pretty much. So that's going to be intense. Uh, other than that, I'm looking for elite drivers in the golf ball. I love that Spencer talked about apex. We can, I know Min Woo Lee is going to check that box. So that's probably uh, what pushed him up uh, Spencer's board, but a lot of valuable players that I found that hit the ball extremely high that to kind of hold these greens. So I'm um, pretty much with Spencer in general on, on everything. I did weigh accuracy a little higher than distance, but total driving as a whole is going to be very important for me this week because, you know, just looking at it, you can get the weirdest lies in that native land. I'd rather have guys that are just living in the fairway, and if they hit it a little short and can kind of run it up with any club, I think that does help guys that do struggle around the green a little bit. And then just looking at guys with, you know, relative strong data on Donald Ross designs. I did not look at Apex this week, but I did weigh driving accuracy more than usual. And of course, the easiest way to keep the greens, keep the ball in the greens and control your golf ball is from the short grass in the fairway rather than in the sandy native areas. So I put a much more premium on driving accuracy than pretty much I ever do on a PJ Tour event ever. Uh, so that's a big factor for me this week. Fairways this week, 35 to 45 yards wide, but a lot of these Donald Ross fairways are at an angle in the landing area or there'll be some kind of slope that makes it play shorter so even though it is a relatively wide landing area on paper it's going to play a little bit smaller so that also adds to why i added driving accuracy and i'll echo the sentiment on three putt avoidance very important this week and i actually did weigh approach play very significantly a little bit more than usual just because i agree that around the green play is going to be very significant I just didn't know that I had the data that was going to be valuable here because you look, for example, last week, uh, Rory McIlroy spoke about this earlier and uh, Jack Nicholas might, well, probably isn't very happy about it. Uh, Rory noted that last week at the Memorial, if you miss the green, a lot of the times you're just in the thick rough rough near the green and you got to pop it out and you have one kind of shot that you can play. Whereas here at Pinehurst number two, you're going to have a plethora of shots you can play. Like Spencer said, you can use a three wood to bump it up there. My preferred way to do it. Uh, you can putt it. You can use a four iron as Tiger Woods was shown checking out yesterday. You can use a lofted wedge and try to carry it farther up there and carry it past um, a slope or something. So there's a lot of different ways to play the golf course this week. And I think that's pretty cool. So I looked at courses that are firm and fast that we've had on the PJ tour this season. And I looked, I weighed some of the metrics there more heavily. For example, at the Wells Fargo championship a couple weeks ago, want to see how guys did on approach there when those greens were incredibly firm and fast because they were brand new after the redesign. Not everybody played at colonial. In fact, the majority of players didn't, uh, but I thought that was relevant, especially with the short grass around the greens and them also undergoing a new renovation. So I wanted to see how golfers did on the firmest and fastest conditions on the PGA Tour. So I did a combination of 
firm condition courses and also just difficult scoring, which is going to have some overlap. So I wanted to look at golfers who've done well on those type of courses recently. Otherwise, I think we pretty much covered it all. So let's get into our outright betting cards this week. Spencer, I'll sling it to you first. Who you got as we look for our second consecutive U.S. Open winner? I guess we should address the elephant in the room before we get into bets. So I asked this to both of you guys, and it's not the number that you would bet him at because I'm sure we would all give a very similar answer based off of this. Um, it's going to be much higher than what the market would say. What do you think a fair number is on Scotty Scheffler? And then we'll we'll go on from there. I would think about it at, I don't know, four and a half, five to one. I, like, is he capable of doing what Nelly did? Like Nelly took a 10 on that par three at on kind of a, a ridiculous hole in general. We are not going to have that. We don't have the water. But like the carnage that is possibly out here, if Scotty Miss hits one shot, he could make a double or triple. And that could be, I don't want to say that could be it for him because I think he did make a double and a triple and <laughs> it grew his lead on Saturday uh, at the Memorial. But I don't know. The course is just so damn hard. And his Donald Ross history, I know it's limited, is not good. I, I, I'd i rather just, I don't know. I, I'm not betting him. I guess I'll put it that way. I'm probably not playing him in DFS either which is a bit of a probably a suicide mission, but I'm okay letting him beat me. I think there's so many good players in this field. I think people just have to have the best weekend of golf to beat him, and I think many people are set in a position to do that. Roberto, what would your take be there? Pretty similar. I'd be very interested at 5-1. to one. I think that the Sandy native areas are going to play a big factor this week. It's not going to be super easy to tell because a lot of shots you're not going to see on television, but you can get lucky and have nothing in your way, just a clean sandy lie, or you can have to pitch out. And other times you're going to have to make a decision on whether you can advance it all the way to the green or not, or how you're going to approach the shot with your angle and controlling your spin. I think that that makes it a little bit more challenging for Scotty, just because there's going to be some variance. If he gets some bad lies, he could get unlucky. Whereas in a golf course like a Valhalla, where you're just bombing it down there and gouging it up out of the rough. And you're not going to have these terrible lies out of the rough that are going to impede you from going at the green or knocking it close to the green or in a, a position where you can get up and down. I think that's going to make it really tough this week. So I think that's going to, but however, around the green, Scotty Scheffler, I trust more than anybody else still. And I think that's a huge edge. So I did think about betting Scotty. I didn't do it. Five to one is the number that I would take. He, I have to double check when he's teeing off, but who knows if somebody goes out early and posts a number in the morning, and if he has an afternoon tee time, maybe if you want to bet Scotty, that's one way you could go about it, but I'm not going to be doing it. Hopefully this is the week that Scotty doesn't uh, kill us again, because I had Ludwig Oberg at the masters and we all had Colin Morikawa last week. So that's two times I've been Scotty this week, this year in the last couple of months. Hopefully it doesn't happen again this week. I legitimately believe we've reached the moment in golf where I don't, I don't know off the top of my head when Scotty goes off either, but there is a potential that somebody could post a number in the morning and Scotty will be shorter than he was without actually hitting a golf ball. The amount of exposure that sports books have on him right now, everything is being skewed in, in a direction and you're getting these baked in numbers. And it's, it's not to say I want to be very careful with how I word this. Scotty is the favorite for a reason. The discussion that we're trying to have is what is the number where it becomes fair and what is the number where we would actually back it? And for me, as outlandish as this might sound, because it's two differing numbers there, I think he's around fair. Like, I agree with both of your answers in that four to one, four and a half to one, five to one range. I think that's the fair price, depending on exactly where you want to push this. For me, though, to actually recommend and push this wager, we've always been pretty adamant on this show. We need six, seven, eight in a lot of these spots. And the reason why I always give that answer is you have to be very careful with some of these discrepancies between your pricing and your projection and what the number is. Because as you start moving down the board here, and we're talking about these high-end favorites, a slight deviation from where you think it should be really adds up quickly if you're wrong. 
And where it adds up is you need extra exposure to get those bets down. And I'm somebody, and I've talked about it a million times on the show. I bet, and this is not a flat number, I'm betting about a unit or less to win seven units or more. In order to get a bet down on Scotty Scheffler at these plus 333 numbers, 335, whatever the best you can get out there is, I got to put two units in some of these spots, you know, maybe even a little bit more. I don't feel comfortable overexposing my card in that nature. So it's not to say that Scotty's not going to win. He's a favorite for a reason, but you're also not getting any sort of a discounted price here. Whether this is fair or flat and even, we have to be very careful as an industry to not go into this mentality. And, and I think that sometimes this is what ends up happening where people want to say, specifically at a major championship, I hit the outright this week. Look at my card. I had the outright winner. But long-term profit and value is so much more valuable than trying to tally up how many winners you hit in a year. I don't care how many winners that you end up hitting. It's how much is your ROI compared to what everybody else's is. And I say all of that to give an answer that I decided to go very aggressive myself. I, I did it in a way where I didn't end up betting Scotty Scheffler, but I attacked the top of the board and I, and I got two numbers where when this entered early on Monday, where bet three, six, five had Xander at 13 to one. There was a book out there that had Rory at 14 to one. Those little minor discrepancies from where the prices are at now allowed me this ability to be a little bit more aggressive on those two stances. But I think there's so much to like about those names alongside Scotty, because Yes, Scotty is over a stroke better in strokes gain total or a strokes gain T to green, excuse me, than everybody else in the field. If you start looking strokes gain total, it starts getting a little bit closer. There's two players that are over two shots per round. You have Scotty who's over 2.6. You have Xander who just gets past the two range there. Everybody else is going to be less than that. But I guess for me, when I look specifically at Rory and Xander, is the one thing that they have that Scotty could potentially not in some of these spots is the putting acumen that at any time they could go nuclear with the flat stick on this quick Bermuda. And it's going to take that concept to beat Scotty because if you already have a deficit with the ball striking, you're hoping to, in order for this bet, and, and we don't even need to use Xander and Rory for this example, but in order for Scotty not to win, you're going to need him to be neutral or worse with the putter, which there is is a negative trajectory in my model on similar green complexes. So that's at least a positive. You're trying to find a reason to fade him. And then you're trying to find the one golfer that can keep the ball striking close enough to him and can go nuclear with the putter to where Scotty loses a stroke, a player like Xander or Rory gain five, six shots. And now you're in this position where the outright bet has a chance and ends up winning and Scotty comes in fourth place. So I thought there was more of a big three in this tournament than the market's actually leading you on to believe. There is a discrepancy difference from number one to number two and number three, but I also had a discrepancy difference from number two and number three below that if you want to say that Oberg's injury is generating some cause for concern, which for me there was. So I bet the two of them, I took a Deki Matsuyama at 55 to one. This is a number grab spot. He's going to be a model darling for anybody who runs their math. Like he has dominated with his iron play over the years at U.S. Opens. He's gained over five shots to the field with that area of his game over the last handful of tournaments that he's played at the U.S. Open. You add that to him being one of the best around the green players in the world. Thought this was a very good price to consider Hideki. And then the best I see in the market right now in Min Woo is 80. I got him at 85 to one at bet three, six, five wrote that in the best bets outright article at action on Monday. There are a lot of similarities in my math. When you look at Wyndham Clark last year mm -hmm. and what we're getting with Min Woo, like when you're talking about a long shot wager at a major championship, you need someone who's going to overachieve their baseline projection when you're given a very specific venue that's being used. There are red flags that are going to pop up to every single one of these profiles when there's a reason why they've drifted down the board for one reason or another, whether it's right or wrong. But you're always trying to find something within your math 
that shows that at this particular course, this player has a higher upside than you would see during most weeks. Clark had that at the U.S. Open last year. It's one of the reasons why I backed him at 100 to 1. Across the board in a lot of the key metrics of what I was looking for, he popped in those areas. Min Woo gives that same exact answer for me this week. And, and that was the most encouraging sign that I had because we're looking at a golfer. He's fifth in this field when combining long iron proximity plus around the green production. He's third for expected total driving. He's fifth for weighted strokes gain total. I think that weighted strokes gain total stat is where I am most aggressively trying to back this because that's where it starts mimicking Clark's seventh place grade in 2023 at LACC. If you look at those baseline stats of where it should be on any course versus where it is this week, Clark was 20 spots above his baseline when he won. Minwoo Lee is 34 spots above his. I understand the iron play is a concern. Where does he find success? It's from 175 plus yards. Where does he find success? He finds it with his total driving on very similar comp courses. It's volatile, you guys. And I understand that. And even though I've talked about the matchups that I have here and the ways I'm going to be backing him, I just think this is a market error at the end of the day that, well, I, I gave this answer funny enough when I recommended Wyndham last year. I don't know if he necessarily is going to win or can win. But man, this is the ideal spot if he's going to get over the hump and actually get across the finish line here. I really like Min Woolley this week. I don't know that... So I haven't bet him to win outright. I have my doubts about him holding up with his irons for a full four rounds. But there is a lot of reason to be optimistic, optimistic about him. And I think it starts off with his driving accuracy. If you look at the last seven tournaments he's played, he's gained... He's been above average, the field average, driving accuracy five of the last seven times. Last year, he played about 20 tournaments, only was above the field driving accuracy rate six times. So this is a significant improvement for him. He's a really young player, and he's noted that, hey, I grew up, I wanted to bomb the ball. I loved hitting long irons because you hit them far. It's cool. It's hard to do. And he loved showing off with his short game and practicing short game, but he didn't like practicing on the driving range and working on his irons. Obviously he's a professional golfer. He turned pro at like 18, 19 years old. He's 25. He is in his first full season on the PGA tour and he's playing really consistently. Last four starts have all been top 26 finishes gained off the tee in every single start so far this year. He's got an elite trait. If you're going to win a major championship, you're going to need to get above four strokes gained per round. You're going to need to have some elite traits. We saw him pitching him from everywhere at the PGA championship. His putter can get, can get red hot. He's driving, like we said, elite driver of the ball, second on ball speed on the PGA Tour. He's got upside, and he just needs to click. He doesn't even need to be in the Scheffler stratosphere on approach. He's just got to be good, and he can definitely do that. The only course where he's gained a stroke and a half per round on approach so far this season came at the Cognizant Classic in the Palm Beaches, and that's not a course where you're going to have to hit a ton of long irons. So that gives me hope that – he can hit these 150 to 200 yard shots uh, that you're going to be that were demanded at that course that you're going to need to hit the, here a lot as well. And if he chooses to take less than driver off off the tee, he can take that two iron that he absolutely loves and pummel it down the fairways, which is exactly what you had to do at the Cognizant Classic in the Palm Beaches. I don't know that he has the upside. I I, I would have wanted to bet him at like 125 to one, um, so 80 to one. I feel like isn't the number for me, but. There's a six to one out there for a top 10 that I think is pretty juicy on Min Lee. Yeah. The, the one difference, if we're looking for actual upside difference between Wyndham and Min Woo is Wyndham had, had at least demonstrated the potential to win. He won the Wells Fargo leading into the U S open. Min Woo has some wins that are not on the PGA tour and fields that are very good, but it is a challenging ask to say, win your first PGA tour event and do it inside of a major here. So I understand that concept of where there would be concerns and there there's problems with the short iron play. Like, you know, it, we can say that he's elite or at least at least elite in my model from outside of 175 yards, but with the distance that he does have and his ability of how he plays golf and just the course in general, you're never going to have a venue where every single shot is outside of 175. There's a dis disproportionate number that will be, but he's going to have to hit short irons and, if the short irons struggle, 
that's where we can run into some problems because then he's going to put a lot of stress on that short game of his. And you talked to Roberto about him being able to chip in from these spots, but these are much more challenging layouts to where you're not going to be chipping in. You're really hoping to put this within five to 10 feet and then make a putt. And there are some of the metrics from the short game. Like I don't want to talk about how great he is and not talk about the bad. There are negative marks with the short game. And even some of the putting returns that I have that while he can hit the boom potential with it, there's a lot of bust that comes into play too. So it's a high upside, high risk, high reward. So sort of a play. I'm hoping that it ends up mimicking the Wyndham Clark route, but anytime you get a wager like this, there is a floor that you have to worry about. I'll also add that Mimu Lee tied for fifth at the US Open last year, tied for 27th in his only other appearance. So he has played well here in, in these type of championships. And like a Wyndham Clark, Wyndham Clark who bombs the ball and can lead the field in any given week off the tee or with his putter and the short game is also really good. I like that Minwoo Lee has upside in those three other aspects of his game. And the approach play is something I haven't seen as consistently as we saw Clark leading in. Um, but I think that Minwoo Lee is somebody who absolutely could win a big time event very soon. I just want to see a little bit more iron play consistency. And I think he's going to be a really interesting golfer to watch over the next couple of weeks because I think there will be some opportunities for him. Uh, so Spencer, your outright card, Minwoo Lee, Hideki Matsuyama, Xander Shoffley, and Rory McIlroy. Correct. All right. Spent, or Nick, any overlap on those? And who else is on your card? I love it. Yeah, Minwoo Lee is probably someone I'm fading in the DFS market, but did go on the outright side, looked at that top 10 at 6-1. to one. I think that that's probably where I'm more likely to go. Um, Rory McIlroy as well. I took the 12-1. to one. I found a little bit of value on that number. I think that's still a little bit inflated, I think, with the way that he's hitting the ball and kind of just going under the radar right now and the total driving that this course requires. And I believe he's number one strokes gained on Donald Ross courses. 12-1 uh, to one seems like a good number, and I could not afford Scotty on my card for the same reason that Spencer discussed. Uh, Tony Finau, 75-1. to one. Somebody had to do took. it. Yeah, somebody had to, somebody had to do it, and then I have a spot for a hundred to one. I'm interested in Will Zalatoris. I just am not sold on the ball striking right now, so I was in between him and Adam Scott. Um, and then I t- <laughs> two guys that never win. Uh, Tommy Fleetwood, forty four to one. I found value on that number. I think it's a great course for him. I am fine thinking that his first win will come at a major. I have him proper at forty to one. So one of the few guys that I did have value on. Um, so let me hear your thoughts on Will Z, just because it, apparently it was a, a bad number, according to mine. I We don't have to do the Fino thing again if you don't want to. And then uh, potentially Adam Scott at 120. I'll take this first, Roberto. Um, I, I didn't end up making this head-to-head bet. I thought it was intriguing if you shopped around. And I don't know where your numbers, you guys had Corey Connors, but... I thought Tony Finau over Corey Connors in a matchup had some intrigue. Like that was more of how I was trying to get exposure to Finau. I didn't end up going that direction. I do think that there's potential value there. Um, I don't know if you see the same things. I like Finau over Connors. Finau is a better short game player. And I think pretty much everything else is similar. I also trust can't believe I'm saying this. I trust Finos putter more than Corey Connors. Um, and I bet Corey Connors last week to win. I felt really good after he shot four under on Thursday and he was even lower at certain points. And he made three straight birdies on the front nine to get to seven under par. I think he took the lead by himself for the share of the lead on Friday morning. And then he immediately made bogey, bogey, bogey on 10, 11, 12, gave it right back. Uh, so a double turkey there. I don't think I've ever seen that before on the PJ Tour. Corey Connors putter is bad. It's really bad. It's a compliment to say it's bad. He had a great week. Awesome week. uh, The week before at the RBC Canadian Open. And I don't know when the next time that's going to happen. So I would take Corey Connors. I I would take Finau over Corey Connors, although both of them have the ball striking upside to win this week if the putter gets it together. It's just not likely that Connors gets it together. And I think Finau, we've obviously, if you've listened to the show, we mention him every week. Somebody has to bet him. Somebody has to fall on their sword for him. Um, the putter, putting stroke does look better than it has been. I think the clog group has helped him. And I'm intrigued. He's one of the people whom 
just missed my card. I also want to say one thing about Fleetwood before we move on. So look at the U.S. Open. and We can just look at the past five years. Wyndham Clark, Fitzpatrick, Bryson, Woodland. Like, what do all those names have in common? They're all first-time winners of, of a major when they won the U.S. Open. We have talked a lot on this show about Tommy Fleetwood, and it's a very similar answer to where the market corrected itself. And, and Xander's a better golfer than Tommy Fleetwood is when you compare them together. It's not to say that Fleetwood... Here, here's the thing. I'm trying to word this in a, in a direction that... It's hard coming on a show in saying that Tommy Fleetwood can win a golf tournament when he's never done it before. This is such an ideal venue for him where there is this public perception that comes into play. And it's something that we have talked about quite frequently, whether it's with Xander, where the market still moved him, a name like Tony Finau, which we've had this discussion a million times, or a golfer like Tommy Fleetwood here, where this public perception comes into play that they can't win a golf tournament. And really why that's happened in all three of those guys that I've talked about historically is because they are names that are consistently near the top of the leaderboard on Sunday and don't end up getting the job done. And when you look at Xander, Xander wins the PGA Championship, and now all of a sudden this complete different narrative has been built around him to where he's no different of a player in reality. You can make the argument that he's gotten some of these things in his personal life sorted out. Um, his father was a very overbearing presence in his life with his golf game at times. And look, Xander wins the PGA championship and his father's in Hawaii when it happens. So there's, there's that that's come into play for Xander, but from a statistical perspective, Xander's been trending in this direction for years. There's a reason why we have all been coming on shows over and over again and talking about, I, I understand we're betting Xander. He doesn't win golf tournaments. I get that, but there's value in this number because of the statistical profile. Tommy Fleetwood, even more so than Tony Finau, is so much pushing in that direction as a golfer who is primed and ready to win an event. I don't even think at this point that it's less likely that it's a major championship than a regular event. He can win anything. So if we're going to get this boost of his price where we have gotten him quite frequently in a lot of these events at numbers that were borderline unbettable, whether it's 44 to one, like Nick talked about, I think there was a 45 even earlier in the week. I don't know if that's still out there. To me, this is an overcorrection in the market in the other direction where Fleetwood has real potential win equity here. And because the general public has taken on this mentality that he cannot win, you're actually getting value at the price. So Fleetwood was the number one person to miss my card that I did not go with. And that's really because I decided to get ultra aggressive and go Rory and Xander. And when you do that, there's really no other route to go with it. And I already had a Hideki ticket from earlier, but like Hideki Fleetwood, those are the two guys for me in that 40 to 50 to one range that are just prime for a potential big result. I think that if you want it back, Tommy Fleetwood, the ideal places to do it because he's not super long off the tee are places where there's going to need to be a missed fairway penalty. And you want firm and fast conditions because he's a good putter. He's good at everything. And he's really strong with a short game. And you need those to be differentiated. It's not going to be necessarily at a birdie fest or it's going to be harder for him there. So if I look at this golf course, Firm and fast conditions, check. Tough around the green conditions, check. Is there going to be a missed fairway penalty? There's going to be some variance in the native Sandy area, but I think there will be. So I think those all point in the direction of Tommy Fleetwood. You also hear a lot of people who have been in the golf media game saying, this might be the toughest U.S. Open since Shinnecock. Well, guess who shot 63 in the final round at Shinnecock? Tommy Fleetwood. What's been the firmest fastest conditions i think most similar golf course to this one so far this year relatively wide fairways no rough around the greens augusta national where did tommy fleetwood finish there t3 best finish of the season so I think there's a lot of reasons to really like tommy fleetwood this week he like me now just off my card but i'm kind of talking myself into it i don't really have a lot of room on my card uh but i'm very very intrigued by tommy fleetwood and Boys. perhaps maybe a live wager or yeah i'm talking myself into it here i really like tommy i love it I thought I was uh, in a bad spot there. 
<laughs> All right. The Zalatoris one might be more questionable, Nick. I don't like Zalatoris this week. I no, okay, I, that's fair. But I I was looking for a hundred to one because I have room for it, and I I kind of like Adam Scott in this spot. I think there's also something to be noted, uh, and this is reason to be bullish about Min Lee as well. Is something to be bullish about the Australian golfers. This isn't a secret that they play a lot more on these sandy conditions. So they're going to be a lot more comfortable hitting these full shots. They might have a little bit di- different feel than most other golfers. So I think there's a lot of upside there. And Adam Scott is just a, a weird golfer this year who has been decent at everything, but just hasn't put the pieces together. So I, if you want to bat Adam Scott, I do think that they're, that the outright market is a great way of doing it. So I like that. I, I was enjoying life a lot more trying to fade Jason Day than backing him in markets. Like last week at the Memorial, we had to sweat out a couple of those bets. Round one, took Sepp Straka, my fade this week, took Sepp Straka against Jason Day, and it needed everything to go right down the stretch for that to become a victory. Sung Jay looked dead in the water to him after day one, and that turned around also where Sung Jay shot himself up the board. But I will say this. I don't want to go over the top with the Jason Day answer, but I think he's a legitimate top 30 player in this tournament from a win equity perspective, as much as I didn't want to back him last week, and I'm not going to get there in the outright market. Although I do see that number trending upwards in a very nice direction where there's some triple digit totals that seem intriguing, but I kind of like him for DFS and I think there's intriguing routes. Maybe, maybe it's an in-tournament answer above anything else where the head to head market might be an enticing route for to go on him this week. Jason Day has gained more than one stroke on approach per day in a tournament since the beginning of 2023, one time. It's bad. He won that tournament. He's like Min Woo Lee and like uh, old Wyndham Clark in that he can do everything else at an elite level except for hit his irons. Uh, But when he does hit his irons, well, he's going to be able to go low enough to win. So I always think that there's upside with Jason Day. It's just a question of how he's going to, I don't, I don't necessarily like backing him in these golf tournaments where you're going to have to hit a bunch of long irons, but if you want to do it, he definitely still has upside to win hundred percent. And I think you can do it in safety markets. Like for sure. There's the iron play is the only thing within my model that took him outside of the top 50 from any of the seven categories that I ran. He was consistent across the board and weighted strokes gain total scoring on hard courses, how he's played at major championships, expected scoring for Pinehurst. That's what we didn't see last week at the Memorial where he was arguably the, him and Zalatoris were the two biggest fade, and I guess Wyndham Clark, were the three biggest fade candidates that I had. And it it took Zalatoris until Sunday to actually show his implosion that I was waiting for the entire week. Day was probably a lot better than I anticipated him being. There was there, while he got lucky on day one, there was a lot of real about his game that he put together before that. So I think this is a nice spot for him. I'll get into my outright card quickly, and then we'll let Nick uh, share some more picks because I know he's got to bounce soon. My outright card's really short this week. I'm going back to the well with Colin Morikawa. I love his form coming in. Last week we noted that after the players – or after the Valero Texas Open, he and his coach split up. He was with, um, so he had worked with his childhood coach, Rick Sessinghaus, for a long time, 18 years. Then uh, he broke up with, he got together with Mark Blackburn, won immediately at the Zozo Championship last October, and was with Sessinghaus until Morikawa broke up with him after the Masters. Then had his third consecutive week where he lost strokes on approach at the Valero Texas Open. That was his first time of his career, losing shots on approach in three consecutive starts. Following that, he started talking with Sessinghaus, his longtime coach, once again. He played well at the Masters, uh, top five finish there, top five finish at the PGA Championship, and now nearly won last week. You look at what he's done recently. He was having the work. He's still technically having the worst year on approach of his career, never ranked outside the top three on the PJ tour from 2020 to 2023. Uh, Cause he graduated in 2019, didn't have a full year there on the PJ tour, but never ranked outside the top three on approach for four straight seasons. This year he's 51st, but before the masters, he was 80th. Since then he's gained just over 0.8 shots on approach per round, which 
if that was what he averaged for the full season, he would rank fourth for the year on approach. But more importantly for me, he is playing the best golf of his career everywhere else. If you look at his data golf career summary, he's getting more strokes per round in 2024 putting around the green and off the tee. So he's doing everything better than ever except for approach play. And I think the approach play is back to its normal level. Last week was his best week in terms of strokes gained putting for the entire season. It was his best week in terms of approach play for the entire season. And it was his best week in terms of off the tee play. He still didn't win. Um, but it gives me reason to be optimistic about this week. I love the putter. And Spencer, I thought you nailed it earlier when you said that the way to beat Scotty Scheffler is somebody who has putting upside this week. They've got to be within striking distance from tee to green, but the putter needs to be an advantage over Scotty Scheffler. I'm writing an article that's going to drop tomorrow morning here on Action Network about the X factors for the U.S. Open. And the biggest X factor is Scotty Scheffler's putter. Because if that thing is gaining a stroke per round, say goodnight. We don't even need to talk anymore. But putter could be the great equalizer, could be a magic wand for somebody out there this week. And so I wanted two guys who have upside to beat Scotty Scheffler. So I went with Colin Morikawa and Xander Shoffley. Those are my two guys. We've already talked at length about Xander Shoffley. So I'll sling it to Nick. Nick, who else you got on your card besides, or besides, um, well, we already mentioned your outright card. We mentioned your uh, play on Richard Mansell, four to one for top 40. Who else you got this week? I uh, pushed a ladder on Richard Manziel, top 20 ties pay in full at 11 to one. And then Sam Burns is kind of my like safety blanket this week. I think everything that we talked about, about this golf course, the apex elite driving of the golf ball, three putt avoidance. I do think his iron plays in, in some of the best spots that it's been in his PGA tour mm -hmm. career, top 20 at plus 240. And that is all she wrote. And I'm excited to do one and done real quick before I hop off. Oh yeah. So we both had Colin Morikawa. You hitched, yourself to my wagon four of us i think got 2.2 million so nick's still within striking distance uh nick you want to say who you're playing this week i gotta pull this i uh, was hoping for you guys input i think i have to go with a live guy um so i was leaning brooks kepka i have i do I have, have... john oh. rom has just withdrawn from the u.s open due to a foot infection so don't take him that makes sense all right so yeah not him he was not in the running i think i already used him anyway and he missed a cut, so that was fun. Um, that was Brooks, cool. Bryson, and Hovland are my my three. I don't know if I'm buying into everything Brooks. I feel like the market just absolutely loves him, but he is playing such good golf. And again, listen to his interview this week. He's been the most honest guy in golf, in my opinion. He says his game is in a great spot. I believe that. Um, but I think Brooks is kind of going under the radar. A great driver of the golf ball. Seems to be a good course fit, in my opinion. So uh, I'm leaning Brooks, but... If I did not have to force a live guy, maybe I don't. Being in the top three, I would go with Victor Hovland based on my player pool availability. I don't know if this influences you any, but it does seem, at least from what I can tell, that the market hates Brooks Kepka. So I, I don't know. It does. It does, but I, I don't see why. I don't see why either. I, I like Brooks this week, and I don't know how you guys have – the optimal players still in your player pool is we know what we're doing clearly a, I mean. apparently because <laughs> i don't have colin morikawa available couldn't have used him last week even though i would have liked to and then I i'm looking right now as nick was talking of my player availability of what i actually have left where did i use all my players i, I have wyndham clark left i have john rom who we've just talked about i have keegan bradley i have sep straka Terrell Hatton, Jason Day, Tom Kim. Like, what happened to all my players? Everybody else is gone. Talk about just blowing this up early in the season and having nobody left to play with. Yeah, I try not to use the big name guys in the small purse events. So we mentioned this at the Charles Schwab Challenge betting preview. I was going to play Morikawa, and I talked myself out of it because I said, why am I using him now? He's just getting into form. I'll wait for the memorial. So I actually did something right. Uh, for once, but Nick, you, 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 you stole everything I was about to say. I have three guys. I was considering the same exact three as you. <laughs> I currently have Brooks in there. I would want to use Hovland, but I want to save Hovland for later. I'd rather use somebody that I can't use anywhere else outside of the open. 
So I'm looking toward Brooks. I love the long iron play. I have my doubts about the putter being strong enough for him to win this week if Scheffler is on. However, I feel like Bryson is kind of at the top of the market right now, and I'd rather save him for the open. I feel like he'd be better suited to bomb and gouge there than around here. I think you're going to need to have more control of your golf ball. Winning scores would be a lot closer to par. Just screams Brooks, Brooks kept it to me. We already mentioned the U.S. Open at Shinnecock. Obviously, Brooks won there. So I like Brooks this week. I think he's going to be my guy. I, I also don't have Brooks Kepka available. Used him at the PGA Championship. I would like an investigation into my player pool. I feel like I'm getting cheated right now. We also, for the record, we had somebody use Scotty Scheffler last week, which means that just about everybody who used Scotty Scheffler won with him, except for Spencer and me. Spencer used him <laughs> at the three, and I used him at the uh, at the Genesis Invitational, which was the last tournament where he lost strokes putting. Since then, he's gained strokes every single time, and he wins or finishes second every time he's not in jail over the weekend. So, um, I, I'm leaning, I guess, for my pick to give a real answer, just because I, I mean, I legitimately that's not me exaggerating. I have nobody left. I'll probably take Ben on or Min Woo. I like those two guys. I think that decent contrarian picks. Keegan Bradley is also very intriguing. I think he was my fourth guy this week. But I obviously we, we have the Travelers next week where he's the defending champion and perhaps maybe a club down course like that could be suited for him. Uh, I'm not sure that I want to use him at a big pool or a big purse event. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple plays that I was considering that I want to run by you guys. I was looking at Ludwig Oberg, top debutante. Let me pull this one up very quickly. Um, I wanted to take him out right, honestly. I, I saw enough last week. His ball striking numbers were fantastic, and he is a perennial driver of the golf ball. Every every bucket that I cared about, he seemed to do very well at. I guess just lack of down Ross history was maybe my only concern, but he's got Joe Scovran on the bag, correct? So. Again, kind of my master's mentality on why I want to back him, and 22-1 to 1 is there. I just don't have the room. I'll get into that top debutante market in a moment. Um, I'll find it because there was only two golfers who were shorter than 10-1. to 1. Nikolai Hoygaard was 9-1. to 1. Basically, everybody else was a Corn Ferry Tour or European Tour player uh, or just an open qualifier without status. So I thought that Ludwig Oberg – could cash this with a top 30 finish pretty easily, perhaps. So I really like Ludwig Oberg there, top debutante, plus 170. I was also in a similar way of thinking about the Kitayama bet. I was also looking at Ricky Fowler, except Fowler is in the morning, so he'll have a relatively softer conditions. But Fowler over 72 and a half, unlike Kitayama, who finished third to dead last last week, Ricky Fowler was dead last at the Memorial and just hasn't had it together at all so far this season. I can see basically anything falling off the rails for him. He's still looking at a couple different putters right now. I don't have a lot of reason to be confident in Ricky Fowler, and I thought fading him immediately was going to be the only chance because I don't think he's going to be around for the weekend. Any thoughts on that, guys? Speaking of putters, real quick, though, Roberto, Richard Manziel, Team Lab. And with that, I'll let the boys go. Finish strong. All right. Thanks, Nick. We'll catch up with you next week for our preview of the Travelers. Spencer, any thoughts on Ricky Fowler this week? I'm more in the ballpark of where you would be. Like, he's a negative value in my model. He's essentially a 50-50 made cut candidate. Maybe I'm not as low on him as you would technically be based off of that answer, but it's... There is a lot of the market and we see this quite often, which is funny. The market holds on to certain players where there's this nostalgia factor, nostalgic factor that comes into play where, you know, even if you look last year with Ricky at the U S open, that was his event to lose for a very long time. And there's, there's a lot that is going wrong with his game right now to where from a statistical perspective, he's a negative value. And then from any of the recent stuff, he's a massive negative value. So um, 
I don't know how I feel necessarily. Like I could see him for one day being able to keep it within that number early in the morning, but I think at some point he's going to be a target to potentially take on in a matchup because the market will be too high on him somewhere. Yeah, he's got a lot of 45th place finishes and no cut events, so kind of hard to read into that too much. And it, I just don't see upside anywhere in his game right now. That's what that's the problem. Hasn't really gained a stroke basically in anything for four straight rounds um, with any cons- more than once so far this season. Both of them actually came at the Charles Schwab Challenge, uh, which is interesting. But that's a club down course, which is very different than this one, where also he doesn't have that edge of knowing the golf course like he does that one as a ver- as a PJ Tour veteran. His Speaking around the green game. game could be able to maybe save him for a day. But yeah, outside of that, like any of the approach metrics are really subpar. I haven't bet that one yet, but I'm on the edge. One I have bet is Tyrrell Hatton, minus 114 over Jordan Spieth in a tournament matchup. Statistically, Tyrrell Hatton's just a better golfer than Jordan Spieth right now. Very consistent throughout the bag. Uh, accurate driver off the tee. Jordan Spieth, his approach play is in the worst shape in recent memory, both for the season and also recent form. Looking at his data golf page, he's lost strokes on approach in four of his last five starts and has only gained strokes on approach in three of his last 10. The putter is also relatively ice cold and is coming off of the best week off the tee of the whole season, even though he missed the cut last week. So just Jordan Spieth continues to bomb the ball off the tee. He's driving it better than he ever has in his career and nothing else is really working for him. I think Tyrrell Haddon coming off of an underwhelming PGA championship performance and not a great performance at live Houston either. I thought there's a, a little bit of value in buying low there, but also fading the nostalgia, like you said about Ricky Fowler and Jordan Spieth being somebody that, Hey, the books know they might be able to get action on Spieth, even though they want to fade him. Probably 50-50 for me, Roberto. I don't have a massive take one way or another with it. Like if you force me to pick which one I think is going to win, I lean towards your Hatton route just because their profiles are surprisingly similar within my model where their overall rank was just inside the top 45 for each one of them. Hatton was a little bit better than that. And then each one of them had positive trajectory for upside, which would make sense with Spieth not being able to do anything right right now from making cuts, but actually producing statistically in some of these areas. And then uh, the safety numbers fall pretty far for each. Like Spieth fell to 56th in my model. Hatton fell to 46th. So uh, for me, that's probably a stay away based off of that, just because I think you have two volatile golfers. But um, I mean, if you're lower on speed than I am, then I mean, it makes sense based off of that. Or higher on Hatton, either way on it. I think I'm higher than the normal on Hatton, and I faded speed relatively consistently on the show and done pretty well with it. You uh, have, there's yeah. another matchup. Well, I want to talk about Isaiah Salinda. He's an interesting golfer um, whom I have two bets that I'm eyeing right now. Top 40, 5 to 1. I'm very intrigued by, he's a golfer who does his best on challenging golf courses. He is on the Corn Ferry Tour. He won the Panama Championship by eight shots on one of the few very tough golf courses on the Corn Ferry Tour. There is no shot tracking data, so we don't have the specific strokes gained metrics, putting around the green approach off the tee every single week. But I know that he plays golf, his best golf on tough golf courses, open qualified here this week. Uh, had a top 15 finish last week on the Corn Ferry Tour, where, where I think he shot six under par on the final round. So he enters with some momentum. He plays a tough golf course as well. I thought the top 40 number was pretty juicy at five to one. Another way of backing him is in a three-way money line. So first, ra- or so first round against Jim Herman. Jim Herman had a PGA Tour card last year. Isaiah Salinda did not. Isaiah Salinda had one more top 10 finish on the PGA Tour than Jim Terman did last year. He had one top 10 finish last year on the PGA Tour. He had two starts. Uh, That came in Spencer's backyard in Las Vegas, where he tied for seventh. Salinda gained strokes in all metrics, putting around the green approach and off the tee. We have not had a start with data like that since then for Salinda. I think he's just somebody whom nobody has really much data on. And... 
for full reference, he was in my grade at Stanford. I've followed him a little bit more closely than most others just because of that um, of that closeness. And he won a national championship for Stanford as well and played well in tough golf courses. So I followed him. I think this is a good spot to fade Jim Herman. I think he could shoot us an 80 and maybe win this matchup over Jim Herman, quite honestly. Uh, Jim Herman did so poorly on the PGA Tour last year that he does not have status really anywhere. Uh, well, he's 46 years old, so maybe he does, and he's just choosing not to play. But he's played in two Corn Ferry Tour events, missed the cut in one, T54 in the other, played the Puerto Rico Open, T49 in that one, and missed the cut in Corrales. Has never finished in the top 45 at U.S. Open. He's only had five opportunities, even though he's on the very um, downside of his career. I don't know how many guys he's going to beat this week, and I th- I don't like betting minus 162s. We never do that on the show. I never do that. But I think maybe if you're looking for a parlay piece or if you just want to bet that on the three-way money line, I think Salinda is a much better golfer than Jim Herman right now, and I like that one. I think when you look at markets like that, ties become a lot less prevalent when players are struggling to produce a score. So, you know, if you are correct that Herman goes out and let's say Herman shoots 12 over par for the day, it's much less likely that you're going to end up getting a tie in there somewhere. And and of all the players that I have qualifying metrics for, so enough rounds inside of my sheet that I could actually feel comfortable pulling from them. And usually when I include my data, I need a certain amount of rounds to actually include them into the sheet. Herman is the worst in the field based off of those golfers where negative 1.41 strokes total he has. He is almost bright red across the board, which is not good inside of my sheet. You want to be bright blue. Driving accuracy looks good for him. The GIR percentage looks fine. Some of the proximity totals are okay, but the problem is you look at the long iron proximity, that's where it really starts going south. Like he is as red as can be, and I'm I'm bringing it up right now because it must be the worst. Yeah, he's the worst in the field from 175 to 200 in my mass. So uh, those are not positive totals for a golfer that has shown no signs of life now for, I mean, really like in what, four or five years, like outside of like your random result here and there. Yeah, he won not too long ago, which is why he still had a PGA Tour card. He won the Wyndham Championship in 2020. So he was looking at his his data golf profile from 2020 is ridiculous. I don't think he had a single top 25 that season. And keep in mind, the Wyndham Championship is the last tournament on the PGA Tour's regular season. So he probably, who knows, with the second or third place finish, might not even kept his card, but you get the win, you get the couple of years of exemption. So that prolonged him and his career on the PGA Tour. And I'm not quite sure how he qualified. I'm assuming open qualifying because nobody's extending a special exemption to Jim Herman. He's not Tiger Woods. Um, I I, I like the fate of Jim Herman. I consider this being my best bet, but I just don't know how many people have access to it. So I just didn't want to give the best bet that people can't bet. That makes sense. Um, I got a couple others to run by you. I was looking at, Mac Meissner over Takumi Kanaya. This was also three-way money line plus 100. Um, I wanted to back Mac Meissner. I think Kanaya is an interesting player too. Any thoughts on those guys? My model always likes Meissner. Um, and even specifically for this venue where with it being a major championship and not necessarily expecting him to grade as high as you would, he was inside the top 50 for me in pretty much every iteration of what I looked at. And, Um, I don't have a ton of information and data on Kanaya. A lot of it is just being pulled from a handful of uh, of tournaments that I do have. Like he's 15th in my model in strokes gain around the green when you have hard scoring conditions. Maybe that's somewhere that you can look as a positive, but he's pretty much outside of the top 100. Or he is, I shouldn't say he pretty much is. He is outside of the top 100 in every other of the categories that I ran. So I would lean towards you being on the right side there. Just looking at Meissner's recent history on the tough golf courses, he's played pretty well. T10 Valero, uh, miscut at Punta Cana, which surprising, um, not, a, not super tough there. Byron Nelson missed the cut, but that was really easy. T5 at the Charles Schwab when it was playing really firm and fast, made the cut at the Canadian open, had a really rough putting week, T57. 
I like Meissner. I like his game. Up and coming guy. I don't necessarily want to fade him. I don't necessarily want to fade Kanaya. He's been playing pretty decent golf recently. I know he missed the cut at the PGA Championship, but I'll keep an eye on Meissner. I'll try to back him against somebody else. But that was intriguing just because you get a plus 100 on him. Um, looking around, what did you think about Russell Henley plus 105 over Patrick Cantley? This also is a three way money line. The statistical data around Henley had some concerns in my model, but inside the top 15 overall, you compare that to Cantley. I, I I'd say it's a coin flip if we're being honest, like I would ever so slightly lean in the direction of Henley being the correct side. So you want to say getting a plus number gives you some value there, but this is coming from somebody Roberto that's always higher than consensus on Patrick Cantley. And it doesn't mean that I want to back him this week. He's not the goal for the season that we've seen in years past. But some of the long-term data still provided enough of a floor for me where there were 15 golfers that ended up grading inside of the top 50 of every single category that I looked at this week. Cantley ended up being one of those 15 names. I believe Henley missed Hmm. for just one reason. I can tell you what it is very quickly. He missed because, if I can find it, uh, long iron play plus around the green. So... Uh, some of the long iron proximity from Henley pushed him very, out, very slightly out. Like he was 54th overall. Um, that's about as close as you can be to not actually make that list, which is why my model seems to think that both of these two guys are close. But if you look at the 15 players that landed inside of the top 50 for every single category, it's essentially every one of your favorites. And then if you want to look at any of these long shot options down the board, which wouldn't necessarily be the Cantley answer here, but it's Ben on, it's Sung J M, it's Min Woo Lee. Like that's, it's the same names that I've talked about quite frequently on this show. And then outside of that, it's going to be your four or five favorite, I guess, Scotty, Rory, Xander, Brooks, Oberg, Morikawa, uh, Fleetwood. I think that's kind of one of the reasons why I'm so high on Fleetwood this week. And a lot of these other guys that we've talked about. So for those who aren't initiated, Spencer runs his model from a two-year running perspective where the farther we get into the season, the more weight you put on this year's results. I want to fade Cantley because this is, I believe, one of the rare opportunities where there is a missed penalty for, or a missed fairway penalty. Last week, we noted that as well. Cantley missed the cut. He... Lost more strokes off the tee last week than he has in the last. Well, I'm I'm keep going here. Um, all the way through 2020, all the way through 2019, all the way through 2018, through 2017. That was his worst result since off the tee since the Travelers Championship in 2014 in June. So that's nearly 10 years. His worst week off the tee. Patrick Cantley has been a great player on the PGA Tour because of his combination of driving accuracy and length. That is not here this year. Last year in 2023, he ended the calendar year where in courses where they had where they tracked this, he was above the field accuracy off the tee in 15 consecutive tournaments. So far this season on the PGA Tour, he has been above the field driving accuracy two times in about a dozen starts. That is a significant difference. And a key part of what made him great is absolutely gone this year. That's why I wanted to fade him against Russell Henley, who is, I believe, uh, top five, top 10 in driving accuracy so far this season on the PGA Tour. So I just thought that was a big leverage point uh, where I can back him. I I think I'm talking myself into it. So I'm gonna bet Henley there, plus 105. Three way money. Can I just give you one alternative? Yes. Or not even trying else. to convince you necessarily, yeah. just to throw it out there. So I agree with pretty much everything that you've said with Cantley trending in the wrong direction. Like you, you can't make an argument against that. This was a golfer a year ago in a lot of these spots, maybe not major championships, but he was like 10 to 1, 12 to 1 to win events. And now he's one of these options that nobody wants to back. But inside of my model, One of the things that I looked at, and this is from a much shorter duration of time, this usually when I try to pull it, I pull it over and it's, 
could be a little bit further back just because you're not going to get these examples every single week. But I usually try to pull it from some duration of time between 12 to 24 rounds. Depending on where that answer is, you can start pushing this a lot further down the board with it. But when you looked at similar comp courses, so that would be strokes gain off the tee in hard scoring conditions, strokes gain off the tee where there is a miscut penalty when you do miss a fairway, um, strokes gain off the tee where there's hazards and, and things of that nature and places that you can go where you need to be inside of the short grass to find success. In all of those areas, he graded inside of the top 50 of my model with him pushing as high as number three in strokes gain off the tee at hard scoring and 15th in strokes gain off the tee with uh, these challenging fairways. That put him 16th overall for weighted total driving. I'd have to go back to see exactly where that's pulling from for that since, as I said, not every single tournament that we're going to be looking at fit those requirements there. But at least inside of my model, we have seen some sort of an indication from him that when you give him similar courses and similar concepts off the tee, he has been better than his baseline projection if we want to shorten the baseline to more recent in those setups. So as I said, this isn't necessarily even like trying to talk you in or out of a play. I think this is a very 50-50 sort of a proposition, which the market has priced that way. And as I said, I probably lean from a safety answer towards the Henley route, but this is is truly like a flip a coin and for me and figure out which way to go just because of where those driving totals landed. I will note that even though Cantley has not been above the field average driving accuracy, he still has been gaining strokes off the tee uh, in the majority of those starts, uh, obviously not last week. So I do think the floor is not as high. It's lower than it's been for Cantley in recent memory. For sure. I also think he could still win the golf tournament and he's been falling down the odds board. If he gets to 80 to one, I'm going to bet him. But yeah, I, 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 that's the thing with major championships. Um, and, and I noted every single show and when, when I went as aggressively as I did, and I think at 80 to one, there's still enough room on my card, even if I'm overexposed to add something that's of that 80 to one variety there. But the upside numbers in my model still present the intrigue, maybe not on the high end level that we were getting 12 months ago, but like golfers like him, Wyndham Clark, and I understand this is me running numbers from a longer term than everybody else is, but these are still borderline top 15, top 18 sort of win equity candidates in my sheet. And it, it does reach a certain point where at 80 to 1, 100 to 1, 125 to 1, whatever numbers we end up pushing out on these guys, there is a realistic route to take because, yes, this is not the Cantlay of old, but there's a reason why this price is now where it is. We're not paying the 14 to 1 or the Xander numbers that you have out there. Him and Xander for, it felt like three years there, every single tournament were priced exactly the same with mm. Cantlay potentially being the one that was harder to get to. Cantley would be 12 to one and Xander would be 16 to one. And you'd have this pushback from the entire industry saying you can't bet either one of those two at those prices. It's a much different game when you can move out to 80. And that's kind of the thing with a major championship is you're going to get drift in the market. So always just be aware for that with majors that if you can keep a little room on your card and you know that you have somebody that the market is not going to like, it's a pretty good chance that those players are going to move a lot further than you would have ever envisioned when the week opened. Cannot echo that enough. If somebody's not entering in form, don't rush to bet on Monday morning. That number's going to keep floating out there. And Cantley's floated all the way to 60 to one right now on bet three, six, five. So couldn't imagine getting that number on him a year ago in a tournament like this. And the approach play upside has been there, but the reason why I like a Henley against him is a, the driving accuracy disparity and B that Henley has been, if you look at his metrics recently, green, just about everywhere, really solid play throughout the bag. And I don't think, I think you, Henley still does not have as great of a chance as Cantley to win this tournament, but I like the floor a lot higher, being a lot higher that, than Cantley's right now. That's understanding to what market you're trying to attack. Just because a player is a bet or a fade in one area doesn't mean that it works across the board in every single um, uh, sector that you're trying to go into. And then from a two-year running, and we'll, we'll close it on this, but a, a two-year running perspective in my model you talked about Henley being number one or right around number one this season. He's number one for me 
in driving accuracy over a two year span with it, with me adding a little bit more emphasis to the season right now. So um, yeah, I mean, it's two players that seem to be going in different directions. I, I do believe Cantley has a higher ceiling. The floor is where the question comes into play here. I also wouldn't be afraid to back guys who have that driving accuracy who might not be as long this week, just in general in any market, because the firm and fast conditions I mean there's going to be a lot more rollout on those shots. So sure, Bryson's going to get more rollout too than normal, and those guys will. But if someone like Russell Henley is hitting 150 yards and Bryson's hitting from 120, that is less of an advantage for Bryson than if they're hitting from 150 and 190, respectively. So I'm not afraid of backing the shorter guys, which is why I included Colin Morikawa in my outright card this week. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And there's there's a there's a million guys to consider based off of that mentality. The the Denny McCarthy's of the world who have found success here. And I don't think he's going to win. And and I talked about Christian Bezade and how I know he has no accuracy, no distance, all the total driving is bad, but um, I think even a guy like Christian Bezadenhout can make a lot of sense here in different markets. And that's one of the reasons why I did back him. I got him at minus 120 um, against Adam Hadwin at bet 365 currently. And I don't think this number is going to last because, yes, there's some there's some sentiment that needs to be said that when I recommended him in my Roto Baller Discord channel at minus 120, we pushed it up into the minus 150 range very quickly. Um, but it's not just that like there's a 125 at bet 365 that has been kind of sitting there stagnant for the last 12 hours. And I do think this probably gets more into the minus 140 range. And hopefully by the time this airs, this is still a, at a 125 number, but I thought there was value in that price just because Hadwin was one of, I don't want to even say overvalued commodities for me because he's so low in the market in a lot of ways you're looking at it, but I guess it was a combination where, when you took those two players directly, I thought Bazadenhout was getting too much of an overcorrection in some ways just because of this lack of distance and accuracy that he has. And if you remove that from the mix, he is a pristine fit in a lot of these other areas with the way that he fits this course. And Hadwin was very middling across the board. It was uh I always like to look as kind of the last the last look inside of my model where I run my numbers, I see what a proper price should be. That proper price for me was more at minus 140, but I like to see how both of those two players compare against one another in every single category that I attached a weight to. And when you look at these two, well, there are some close metrics between Bezadenhout and Hadwin. Bezadenhout was able to clip them in all seven of the categories. So that usually is enough to add a very small little increase inside of my math when I try to figure out what is going on. And if we can do that over the course of a four day bet makes it all the better there since you don't have to just worry about one round. So um, that's the only other bet right now that I have on my card. It's those four outrights. It's the two matchups and hopefully there will be a handful of in tournament bets to consider. Adam Hadwin had not gained more than a stroke per round on approach on the PGA tour since last year's rocket mortgage challenge, the first week uh, rocket mortgage classic, the first week of July last year. So almost a full calendar year. Last week, he gained 2.25 strokes per round on approach. So the best approach round for him since July, or sorry, January of 2019. Hasn't been doing that well on approach. Pops off last week. Maybe a little bit of an overcorrection that you can you can take advantage of. And I agree. But Zayden Out's profile looks awesome once he can just get off the tee. Yeah, it's an overcorrection. And, and you look at Hadwin's profile, and I, I talked about this a little bit with Cantlay a second ago. Hadwin is 27th for accuracy. That's the good number that you're going to find there. But he is outside of the top 100 in all of those. And I don't want to read through all of them again, all the hard scoring fairways, the rough, all those things. He's outside of the top 100 over the recent time frame in each one of those categories. So I don't believe for a player like him, a lengthy venue is a positive. I think it just accentuates all these problems that he can potentially have because of his lack of distance off the tee. And as you said, Roberto, as we keep alluding to over and over again, once we take driver out of play, and I don't actually now believe Hadwin has an advantage with the driver to begin with, it became this wager where I trusted Bezade and Hout with every other part of his game. And if it's bad versus bad off the tee, I'll take Bezade and Hout in, in the other three critical areas with the strokes game totals. 
I'm with you. I'm going to tail you on that one. So be sure to check that one out at our sponsor, Bet365. And a reminder that this podcast is presented by Bet365. Bet365 doesn't do ordinary, and that's why you get more boosts with them than with anyone else. Every day, they power up the odds on hundreds of bets to give you a chance to win more. Bet365 boosts specific markets, your winnings, and even parlays. And they don't stop there. Keep an eye out for their biggest and best odds with the incredible Super Boost. Check out the boost and see why it's never ordinary at Bet365. Must be 21 or older and present in Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, North Carolina, New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, or 18 and older in Kentucky. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. All right, Spencer. Wanted to give, wanted to run down a few quick rapid fire questions. Any live golfers out there that you're looking to back this week outside of uh, potentially, well, no more Rom or Brooks Kepka? My model was higher than consensus. And I gave this answer at the PGA Championship and it didn't work out exactly correct. But I, I am intrigued by Dustin Johnson. A, a U.S. Open has always historically been the venue where he provides his most upside. This outright number opened at 125 to 1. I decided not to go down that route. Maybe I regret it with some of the movement that we've seen. I know he's an underdog in most of the matchups that we're talking about. And there's going to be a lot of volatility to his performances. The very easy answer to give would be Kepka or DeChambeau. That seems to be where everybody's going. Probably in the most intrigued by Kepka, just because I worry a little bit. As much as I like DeChambeau and um, I was trying to figure out a way to back him in the other majors, some of this short iron and, and his lack of ability around the green in these spots could potentially find some problems with the turtle shell landing zones that he has. So I probably, if we're talking about who's the most likely person to win, it's probably Brooks Kepka. but who's the name that actually is the most bettable at their price. It would, I would be intrigued to take a shot at Dustin Johnson. If you have room on a card. Me too. I mean, he could have won three or four U S opens throughout his career. Um, he really had troubles closing events and in some pretty crazy fashion. Uh, Chambers no. Bay in 2015 will forever give me nightmares. That's one of the biggest swings between DFS and all the outright exposure that I had on him that week. That is one of, if not the biggest swings I have ever encountered in golf betting before. Um, that That's a story for another day. I, I ended up, there was no television at, I was... There was no television where I was no. at the time, and no. I was checking the updates on my phone, and you were – I was thinking that you were going to get the update that he was the winner of the tournament um, because it took so long to actually give me the update. And then all of a sudden, it popped up Jordan Spieth as the winner, and I ended up falling in like aisle A32 of the target and was down for the count for a while there. Yeah, clean up on aisle 32. Uh, <laughs> but he did go on to win the next year at Oakmont. Um, in his only U.S. Open win. But, man, DJ should have won a lot more. I mean, the Pebble Beach, uh, I think it was 2010. Yeah. twenty. I mean, 2014 through 2018, he had four top four finishes in five U.S. Opens. And then in his last four U.S. Opens, no worse than a T24. And I know last year he tied for 10th, and he had like that eight that he took on the second day. Um he could still do it. He's been in poor form recently, but the upside is absolutely there. If I had to bet anybody in that 125 to one range, Dustin Johnson's got more upside than anybody else. I agree. All right, Spencer, I'll let you get out of here. Any, uh, well, where can we find your work this week? So you can find me on Twitter at Tee Off Sports. If you like any of the numbers that you heard during the show, you can get that model over at Rotoballer. I'm going to have, hopefully, and this is under the assumption that I can find a matchup every single night. I know there's always a night that misses over from the Action Network platform for the in-tournament bets. I will hopefully, if if you don't see a bet on Action Network this week, it means I don't have a bet that night. So uh, the the hope out of this would be that there should be content every single night that you can find from in-tournament head-to-head bets over at Action Network. And then if you want to hear more of a DFS perspective, the show over at Rotoballer, I have better golf that I do with Nick. Uh, there's a, a lot of content this week. And I'll also be doing tomorrow 
uh, a best bets show here at Action Network, which will go even a little bit more in depth into some of these plays. Awesome. Looking forward to hearing all that. And, and if you're just joining us for a major championship week, you should know that the in-tournament market has been very profitable for Spencer this week. Been tailing basically all those this year. Those are are a great way to capitalize on overcorrections in the market. Spencer publishes his model every night or updates his model every night. It's already out there uh, with the baseline scoring for the golfers each day and what they would have done with the baseline short game and putting and how you can fade them. It's easy to follow. It'll make you smarter. You'll learn about golf and hopefully put some money in your pocket as well. So can't recommend checking that out any more highly. And if you want to find more great work, just check out our Action Network app, the website, uh, check us out in podcast form or on YouTube. We've got you covered not only with golf, NBA Finals going on, WNBA is going on, MLB is in the swing of things. Sean zarello has got his uh, projections up every night that just print money. I don't even watch MLB. I just tailor it. And um, we just got so much great content going on. Be sure to check out the Action Network app. Uh, you don't even need to necessarily read the articles. You can just get notifications on when these guys make their bets. So be sure to check out the Action app. And of course, we got great content on the site for the US Open. Basically, any market you want, we've got an article on it. So be sure to check that out. Or if you just want research or if you're just doing a pool, Steve Patrell's got a great article on how you can get different and leverage, use leverage to win your golf pools. So be sure to check that out. Uh, you can find Spencer on Twitter slash X at TF Sports. You can find Nick on Twitter slash X at Sticks Picks. And you can find me on Twitter slash X at Roberto8213. I want to give a big thanks to everybody who makes this podcast possible, especially our producers, Noah Niederhofer, David Payne, and Matt Mitchell. And of course, I want to give a big thanks to you guys, the fans, for showing us support. Uh, if you like what you've heard, be sure to rate us on the on wherever you get your podcasts, on YouTube. Uh, give us a like, give us a follow. And uh, yeah, thanks for, for following us. And hopefully we'll make you some money this week at the US Open. And we'll be back next week for the champ in the Travelers Championship in what is another signature event on the PGA Tour. Thanks. 